The war had shaken our old faith. Somehow it had to be renewed. And to do that, a new icon of belief had to be found. Henry Ford's assembly line was that icon. It became both the symbol and the means by which we believed we could engineer a world of stability, predictability and prosperity. We began to see the world, particularly the human world, the economy, in its image. No longer a world which might veer out of control, but one perfectly balanced, stable, at equilibrium, which had the dependable and changeless nature of a machine. And they fell back to classical physics, to equilibrium systems, where, if you like, there is a fixed amount to spread. Professor Paul Ormerod was for a decade director of economics at the Henley Center for Forecasting and is today a respected author and consultant. And they used the mathematics of that to try to explain and account for a very elaborate theory uh, of how economies would actually allocate resources in a most efficient way but it was a fixed set of resources they were concentrating on and an equilibrium concept which they borrowed from classical physics before Poincaré made his discoveries. Once we had imagined the economy as a machine, it was a small step to believe we could engineer it, maybe even control it. The idea of an equilibrium system um, became really quite embedded in economics as a description not merely of the market economies of the West, but also of an idealized, centrally planned economy running like a machine um, in complete equilibrium. And for a while it worked. In the roaring 20s, the cars rolled from the assembly lines and the tractors plowed the land. Once again, the plowman followed the herder and the pioneer came to the plain. A wave of optimism flowed from the factories and fields of the new world. He had the manpower. He invented new machinery. The world was our market. And we seemed to be back in control. But only for a while. We may have wanted to see the world and the economy as a machine, stable, unchanging, at equilibrium. But how we wish the world to be, and how it actually is, are not the same. This is the massive Fisher Car Body factory in Detroit. Once it was part of the seemingly indestructible US auto industry, part of the good times, which we thought would never end. But in 1929, they did. But the wind still blow and the sun still bakes the land. We must practice control and conservation if we are to save the rest of the draft. The Without warning, the world reached not one but two tipping points. The climate and the economy both lurched without warning, without obvious cause, from equilibrium to chaos. The nightmares of the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl were upon us. The Great Depression of the 30s was a major problem for equilibrium economics. The, la the market for labour, for hiring and firing people, wasn't in equilibrium because one in four people didn't have jobs. And yet even this was not enough to get us to give up our faith in the world of order, equilibrium and control. According to the equilibrium view of the world, there couldn't be anything inherently wrong or unstable with the economy. People themselves must have caused the breakdown. But the basic argument, and it still remains the same today, is that people were, in a sense, weren't really um, involuntary, they weren't, they weren't unemployed because they'd been sacked. They were choosing to take, it's incredible, but this is true, uh, they were choosing to take leisure and be unemployed rather than work. That was the core of the explanation, that, that people were making a rational choice uh, between consumption and leisure. So essentially the Great Depression was essentially a, an extended holiday for tens of millions of Americans. But certainly many uh, you know, major academic economists, including uh, some Nobel Prize winners, subscribe to this theory. <laughs> The experts at the time found it impossible to imagine 
that the Dust Bowl or the Depression were in part caused by inherent instabilities or tipping points in the systems themselves. Another decade of reckless use, and the grasslands will truly be the great American desert. There were no tipping points. The cause we decided was reassuringly simple and mechanical. I think when we were thinking in a more linear way about the world, we tended to look for causes that fitted outcomes. Um, actually, if you're talking about instability, of course, I mean, say you've got a pencil balanced on its end, it doesn't really matter which breeze blew it over, something was going to blow it over. So you could say, well, that particular eddy caused this thing to tip, but really the only thing that matters is it was going to tip anyway, it was unstable. And then, so when you get to the view of the world having these bifurcations, tipping points, then um, you, in a sense, the causality is less critical. It's just that the system is going to change. But while we were adapting to changes in environment, we paid the price of feeling insecure. Despite all the chaos and turbulence of the 30s, despite the blighted lives and misery, economists and scientists continued to see the world as they always had, believing that the uncontrolled would one day be brought within our grasp. It was the invention of the computer at the end of the war, which suddenly seemed to promise a level of understanding and control we had never had. If the assembly line had been the icon of the 20s, here was the new icon of power, prediction, and control. Scene 64, take two. In the 40s and 50s, we got our first glimpse of that icon at work when the military unveiled the top secret technology that had helped win the war. This machine is as complicated as it looks. The ENIAC was the first all-electronic high-speed computer which was ever built in the whole world. The only difference between a human being and the ENIAC is that the ENIAC is much faster. The very first job the technology of tomorrow had been given was the old military task of calculating the angles, elevations and velocities of the firing tables but it was soon essential to a new and frightening power. We do all firing tables for the Army and all bombing tables for the Air Force. Whenever a gun is pointed towards an enemy, we have done some computations to tell the artilleryman how to direct his gun in order to hit a certain target. The test was scheduled to observe results not only was the computer calculating the aiming and launching of the bomb, it was also the only way of doing the vast calculations necessary to understand the explosion itself. Yield 15 kilotons. Unlike the situation with an implosion weapon, the scientists were here able to observe fireball growth from a body of fissionable material. Science is not just uh, uh, proving theorems, it's to give us some power over nature. The old Newtonian magic of ballistics was married to the godlike power of the nuclear age. If we could control such power, was there anything we couldn't predict and control? It's hard for us to imagine, I think, what the effect of the, uh, of the atomic bomb must have, must have been at, at, at the time. I mean, that something seemingly so small actually could have such a devastating, uh, truly horrifying and devastating effect. And we could uh, control it so that you know, we, we had control over it. 